Right. Good afternoon, Mike. Um, lovely to have you with us again. Um, Mike has very kindly offered to share with us uh, the experiences of Owen and Dawn Connor of Oraby Farm in the enterprise area. Um, they're an elderly couple and they've uh, requested that Mike uh, shares this information and, and their story on their behalf. Um, so Mike, without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you if that's okay. Certainly, John, thank you very much. I'm, I'm actually quite honored to have somebody like Owen and Dawn Connor get hold of me and, and they, they're avid watchers of the series um, and say to me, look, they, they wrote down a lot of the experiences during, during the, the time that the, the enterprise area was, was um, in the war. And it's, it's, Owen was without question one of the leading lights in the in the, the part two motorcycle. Uh, he was a section leader, um, a, a very, very brave man. And you'll see from the the, the, um, the footage that, that, I, you know, that I'm going to talk about. What, what are they, I'm basically going to read what they, particularly with the first one that I'll do, which is Dawn. I'll, I'll read what she, she wrote, because it's a, it's a story of a mother, a uh, farmer's wife in, in a very hot area. And it gives quite an insight to people on the whole thing. But let me just set the scene first, John. Um, yeah. Or it'd be fun. Um, everyone remembers going along the Shamba, the road out of through Winsydale, where the, the, the road forked to Shamba to the left and went straight on towards um, Marewa, Mtoko, Nyamapanda, and eventually into Mozambique. Now, the Orobi farm was the last farm about 28, 30 k's along that road. The last farm adjacent, it was right on the tribal trust land as it was in those days, the Chikwaka TTL. The Chikwaka wasn't very wide. Chikwaka was about 20 kilometers wide. And once you got beyond that, you're now in liberated Mangwende tribal trust land, liberated territory. The only time security forces held any ground there is the, the, the ground they were standing on. Um, it was completely liberated, and and the, the whole idea with with the enterprise for the far, the farming area to survive is, is we had to keep the Chikwaka um, at, under control, patrolled, and and uncomfortable for for the insurgents to be in. Now you can imagine that farm being right on the edge. Um, that uh, Owen and Dawn were in the forefront of this whole uh, this whole struggle, and. This is maybe really what their story as to how they went through this, this, this whole thing. But just to go back into background, Owen's parents bought the farm in 1942 and had been there ever since. They subsequently had bought a next door farm as well in, in Owen's time. So it was quite a, a big enterprise. It was, it was a, a successful farm. Um, Owen had a, um, a, a couple of dams on the farm and irrigation and all sorts of things. Um, the main the man, family characters, of course, Owen, um, his wife, Dawn, and then three children. Um, there's Kevin, who was the eldest son, who at the start of the war was just finishing school, Sean, uh, then I think in standard eight, and then Kerry Lou, who was still a, a, a youngster. The, um, they, they'll talk about their experiences going through with the children involved and all that kind of stuff. Just to set a further scene, if you went past the Connors farm, two and a half kilometers further on was a township called Juru. And in that was a, a store called Orobi store. It was actually nothing to do with the farm at all. It just happened to be named that because of the, the, the farm. And that was actually owned by a, a Jewish guy called Irish Garun. Unusual to have a shop owned by a white guy in the tribal trust land, but it was, it was a special arrangement. I'm not sure how it came about. And the manager was a, a Greek guy called George Siracus. He lived just fairly close to the store. There was also a service station there. Remembering that the Chipaka TTL was, was pretty prosperous. Um, most of the people commuted, worked in town. Uh, there were many brick houses, um, all that kind of thing. So it, it was a, it was a, a well-stocked, um, well-supported and successful uh, little enterprise. Now, just setting that, um, the other thing that's important to remember is, is uh, further down into the Chipaka, down going down south, was uh, St. Saviour's School, where there was a uh, Shirley Cripps orphanage. And that was within the within the tribal trust land itself. That will come up in, in the stories as we go along. So, you know, this was a, this was a, at even that point, it was a tar road. 
all the way to the edge of the Chihuahua. Um, then it, after then it, it petered out into a, into a, a dirt road that went all the way through to to uh, to Marewa and and those those places there. It was tarred pretty soon after these we're talking about all the way through to to Mtoka. So if I can set the scene a little bit like that, and I'll start off with just uh, having a look at what Dawn wrote, and she she calls it the war years on Orabi Farm. At the beginning of the hostilities, Owen had been sent to Matoka by the police reserve member in charge, basically on call up. Our sons had returned from Churchill School, along with a friend of Kevin's, Andre de Borgrove, and Kerry Lou, Lou and I had returned from shopping in town. Our cook, Amosi, decided we should have dinner early, claiming uh, Sean had asthma and I was looking very tired. Well, this was all a little bit strange, um, but we did as, as he requested. Anyway, we had supper and gave Sean his medication for his asthma, so he went to bed fairly early. The other two boys, Kerry Lou and I, were sitting in the lounge when we heard a clattering. I assumed that Kevin's horses had managed to come into the yard and headed for the swimming pool as they loved swimming. I went to investigate and noticed a very strange type of lightning to the east over the direction of Oraby store, butchery and fuel station. That was on the most eastern side of Oraby. Andre de Borgraaf, if you remember, he was the one um, son of Mark de Borgraaf, who was Altina Farm, who was attacked in 1972, the first farm in December 1972 ever attacked, uh, and subsequently had been attacked again the next night at Whistlefield Farm. So he knew what the sound of, of, of gunfire was. Andre said, Mrs. Connor, the terrorists are monitoring the store, so come inside. When I got to the house, the radio was blaring RB1, RB1. That was the good old Agric Alert, which was our call sign. And when I replied, the caller asked if I'd been outside. Get inside at once. These commands let me, let me, with no doubt of that I was doing something stupid. The RB store is under attack and has been set alight from the fuel from the service station. Sadly, only the butchery was standing the next morning because of the cold room. Between Andre, Kevin, both with rifles at the ready, and myself, we took turns keeping awake in case the farmhouse were, was, was attacked. We couldn't wake Sean due to the medication I had given him. Owen and Matoka heard over the radio about Arabi being attacked and asked for permission to return home immediately. When he arrived, he found some rather sleepy people to greet him. Andre's parents had been well, some of the, one of the first at attacks in the centenary district, so he was aware of mortars and, and rifle fire was all about. We were only beginning to realize what it sounded like. As soon as the situation became apparent that we would require to jack up our security on the farms, Owen put security fencing around the homesteads as well as around our, our, our compound. We arranged for Peter, my brother, to come and erect grenade screens on, on, on the farmhouse. Owen set up radios in various areas around the fences in order to able to trace any unwanted uh, movements. Just remembering at this time now, uh, beginning of 78, in the Enterprise District had, had up to now been pretty much untouched. So the security fences now went up with speed in the whole district, um, all the way down to the Goromonzi area as clearly things were now heading for, for, for more troubled times. All during these years, both Ian Ross, his great friend, and Owen went hunting in the Lomagundi hunting area known as Doma, always claiming that this year may be our last opportunity to hunt in the area. Naturally, because of the liberation war and the possibility of uh, insurgents crossing from Zambia into Zimbabwe using parts of the hunting area, the women and children were not allowed to go to the Doma hunting area. These two guys, these old Dugger boys, persisted in this hunting right up until 1979. And there's a few stories about that as well. Owen gave his time fully, trying to keep enterprise areas safe as he could, <coughs> being section leader of the yellow section. I joined the police reserve ladies and trained as a radio operator, as indeed most of our ladies in the area. Naturally, we all learned how to handle firearms, especially a, a, a weapon called an Uzi, which was short and not so heavy like the FM. Oribe was attacked many times, but I remember one time I was staying at my mother's house in Avondale as she and my dad had gone on holiday. Kerry Lou was with me as I couldn't get her into Highlands as a boarder, Highlands School of Border at the time, and Sean was still at Churchill School. Kevin by that time had joined the Grey Scouts. 
and we used to go back to Oroby together on a Friday. One Thursday afternoon, Sean said, said he was returning to Oroby as he felt Owen, felt Owen would need him. Well, I said, can't you wait till Friday? Kerry Lewis finished school? No, Sean said, and off he went to the farm. Friday morning came and Rose Prowse, Rose and Dave Prowse were the Connors managers who lived across the road from them. So both our house and theirs, as well as the compound, had been shot at and mortared the previous evening. Sean had been right. When he heard firing and shots hitting the roof, he woke Owen who said, it's just hail. Owen then put, up over the, put a radio message over, it's hailing bullets on my homestead roof, but we are firing back. Consequently, we had to re-roof the entire chalet. It was so full of holes. Many time, Kerry Lou's bedroom took the flak from any attack. So thank goodness she was away on that occasion. On another occasion was Oroby attacked. We were, at, we were attacked from the bedroom side and rocketed, but thankfully the insurgents elevation on their rocket launcher was not very accurate. The rocket was supposed high up over our roof and landed in our neighbor, John and Pat Forsyth's uh, garden. On Dave and Rosa's side, plus the compound, they mortared and it was really distressing to hear Rose and Dave, uh, Rose's little son, Trevor, crying in distress over the radio. Thanks to our lucky stars, Stephen, Gary and Kerry Lou were, were away at boarding school. On the occasion, Barry Lou's bedroom again took many of the shots. The bullet also hit the downpipe of the toilet. The Rick could show that through the vent into the area I was sitting on the floor with the, with the agricultural alert reporting the incident. We received information later. That the reason we were continually being shot at was due to the fact we were classed as a recreation center for the Rhodesian troops. In 1979, Owen was called out to track some insurgents, apparently holed up in a village on the edge of Marewa. He called on his motorbike stick, which were known as the Angels, and two members of the five were able to, only two members of the five were able to assist Owen. So he asked if Kevin, who was an r, &R from the Grey Scouts at the time, could be allowed to come, as well as our Gweebe, pre Gweebe student, Drummond Endersby. So the stick consisted of Owen, Kevin, Drummond, Ephraim Falker, a neighbor, and Andy Hartel, who was a very, very good tracker. Kathy Falker, Ephraim's wife, was on radio duty with me together. When we heard the angels, from the angel that one of their members had been killed in the landmine, I had three chances of it being one of mine, but somehow I knew it wasn't. Kathy immediately knew it was Ephraim. Very sadly, that was the case. Owen had ridden over a mine on the motorcycle, and because Ephraim had a Majiba on the motorcycle with him, the added weight set the mine off, so tragic. When the stick returned to the base, they were all very distressed, especially Owen, who'd known Ephraim most of his life, as Ephraim had come to work for his uncle, Laurie James, on Mashona Cop as a young man. All during the Liberation War, our neighbors were fantastic. Whenever we received radio calls, that either the fire force, the Grey Scouts, the armored cars, or the Hatu guys were needed food, all the ladies rallied around and we started to prepare food. If we happened to have a party stick in residence in the chalet, these men would come and assist the preparations as well. We had a 40 foot cubic, foot cubic foot deep freeze on one side. We kept food that could be heated within minutes. And on the other side, we kept Cokes, which were in glass bottles in those days, but as long as you had them in the wooden crates, they did not freeze. On the back of one of Owen's Land Rovers, I used to place two zinc bars on either side of the gas stove to stop the wind extinguishing the flame so we could take the vehicle to the airstrip and feed the helicopter crews right there. My Frigidaire huge stove had a huge, had a huge oven and never went off for about four years. The chalet where the police reserve stayed had its own gas stove and fridge. Plus I might add a piano, which came up with the pioneers. So if there were any musical musicians within the group, they had a good sing song. When Mrs. Mulligan, of which I've told the story in, in, in my previous, in the Up Enterprise one, who at the time a fairly large lady and fluent in Shona, was abducted from Strathlawn Farm. Owen was called out and he tracked the wheelbarrow in which she was transported as far as the school in the tribal trust land when he was told to stop, as that area at that particular point had been frozen. The slew scouts were operating there. On follow-up preparations, it was discovered um, from a, a book with a map in it that Rose Prowse or I were actually the intended victims. So we had to have a 24 hour guard from there on. Well, I was lucky 
that a nice chap called Steve, who was actually a silversmith by trade from Arizona. And he made Kerry Lou a lovely pendant carved out of coral, which sadly she lost one day when swimming in the pool. And then I had a guy called Mike who followed me around like a dog. Eventually I had to say, I'm just going to the toilet. So he would back off. Rose had a fellow called Joe, um, again, an American. He came with a piece of elastoplast on his forehead. And the plaster remained on for quite a few weeks. And eventually Rose said to him, we really ought to should remove that because whatever's underneath must be rotten by now. When Joe took it off, there was an underneath was a tattoo of the cross that he thought might upset, might upset us, hence the plaster to cover it up. This was my prayer during the Lib War. Lord, I'm grateful for the ability to respond to others with genuine loving concern. You have given me the willingness to lend a sympathetic ear to the moving stories I hear and me to help people in need. Also, Lord, I'm grateful for those good, good memory and skill to communicate my thoughts and feelings effectively. With these gifts, may I spread the message of love to those who yearn for help and understanding. And I'm sure Dawn repeated that prayer many, many times. On 10th of December, 1979, Owen was awarded the Meritorious Service Medal for the Security Forces Division, which he richly deserved by President of then the Zimbabwe Rhodesia, Clifford Dupont, who I met and spent a long time talking to Owen about bird shooting. This is the incident that took place and the reason why Owen received his medal. At the time, we had both sons at home and R&R &R from the Army, plus their friend Doug Smith and our pre greeby student, uh, Drummond Endersby. Owen and I just headed for bed, taking the Agric Alert with us, when a call came over the radio saying that a vehicle headed from Salisbury up the Marewa Road at considerable speed. It had actually broken through the roadblock at the Shamba, at the Shamba turnoff. Owen asked on the radio whether he should put up a roadblock, as he was often known being the last farmer as a long stop. A rather confused reply came over the radio. But then just uh, Dave Stobart, a farmer closer to Salisbury, came on the radio saying that the vehicle had tried to approach his farm and he'd fired at it. It had gone back onto the road and was heading towards Matoka. And then shouted at the young men roadblock. The sons, had, uh, the boys had been cleaning their service FNs and hastily put them back together. Doug grabbed a shotgun. Owen then asked Sean to remain with me as he was the youngest, which I don't think he was very chuffed about. On reaching the main road, Owen parked his vehicle halfway across the road to the left, putting a flashing blue light on the Land Rover roof. He positioned the lads on the right and again called control, asking what action he would take. At that point, there was a, again a, a bit of a confused reply saying, I'll call you back. Owen then moved into the center of the road and with that, the vehicle accelerated, no doubt to run him down. He dropped the torch and fired at the vehicle, which was by then practically on top of him. He had told the young men previously that they had to hold fire until he fired. Well, as soon as he fired, that the boys commenced as well. The vehicle swerved off the road, turned on its side and went about 100 meters when Owen called for a ceasefire. When the first insurgent type person bailed out, they put another volley into the direction of the truck. Doug with a shotgun punched at quite a few holes in the canvas side and of the pickup and maybe a few of the passengers as well. Owen had been fearful that the pickup might have been used by some revelers. Uh, uh, previously, we'd had an, uh, an occasion of some youngsters tanked up, driving up and down the road, shooting at everything they possibly could, to see what reaction they could get. A little bit of a silly move on their part. The radio came to life and reported that Enterprise Base, that they were from Enterprise Base, that they were sending a reaction group immediately and ask Owen and the lad not to move up to the vehicle, just to guard it. They arrived, well, actually I was there as well, and very cautiously moved up to the damaged pickup. And when the word insurgents was heard, Owen was greatly relieved that he had been not made, had not made a mistake and shot at a, at a, at a, an, um, a wrong vehicle. In the vehicle was an RPD, three AKs, a mortar tube, and an RPG with some large rockets, which then turned out to be the, um, the British um, anti-tank rifle that, that was um, used at the fuel tanks in, in Salisbury two days before. Next morning, when the police and special branch returned and examined the pickup, the pounds had been lent to them by 
to go to, to go to ZBC and shake up the town. Some of this information was found in the logbook in the vehicle. Later, when Owen had access to one of the survivors from a, from a pickup, he said the most frightening thing in his life as he was driving the vehicle was being shot at by Boer Connor, as Owen was <laughs> Owen had a reputation. Um, and he was named, he was often called that by his detractors. The vehicle had 19 rifle hits, a couple of shotgun hits, and probably a couple of passengers had been hit as well and wounded. And they would have been treated probably at the Shirley Clips Clinic. A couple of mortar bombs have been left at one of our compound houses. Interesting, as Owen was not strictly on call up at that particular point, he and the boys were rewarded with the recovery of the weapons um, and paid out um, a bounty on those, on those items. Um, Owen was then presented with, quite rightly, with the, the, the medal he well deserved. Um, this is a, one of the stories by, written by Owen Connor. Um, it, it was mentioned in Dawn's one, but this is the actual story he wrote about uh, what he thought was the most unfortunate day when Ephraim Volker hit a landmine. It was 1979, and during this period of time, the motorbike stick, through follow-ups from house attacks, were hitting the insurgents hard in the surrounding areas of the TTL. They had, the insurgents had taken a bit of time off from attacking because of the pressure being put on them by the motorcycle sticks. Now, um, uh, Ephraim Falker was one of the party leaders, and he decided that we must harass the insurgents even more to try and drive them completely out of the out of the area. Every week on days that were uneven, we would do bike patrols into Chikwaka, Mangwende, Chimoyo, Antara, the Chinamora, not randomly, not to run into any path. The stick had a trailer which bikes were loaded on, towed by either a Land Rover or a crocodile, which would carry six new motorbikes, all of which had been fueled up and serviced by Glenn Dixon the local mechanic, um, who also was a party man, and they were arranged to be dropped off at the farm. That day we were to patrol through Chukwaka boundary with Mangwendi, which was divided by the Nyangui River. We uploaded Oribi and sit off there with, Elfram, with Ephraim, Andy Hartel, Kevin Simpson, Drummond Endersby, and Owen and Kevin Connor. I'd asked his special permission for Kevin, who was an R&R &R from the Grey Scouts, to accompany the five, five of us, and this request was granted. While traveling north, we interrupted a gathering of locals adjacent to the Nyugui River. After a brief chase, we were unable to capture any Madivas to gather information, but managed to fire off a few shots at the swimmers who were crossing the large pools, doing doggy, rapid doggy paddle style swimming. We continued north, calling in at various schools, all which were vacant. At one, at one school, written on a blackboard, were threatening messages to the Hells Angels, all in the Shana language. <laughs> So we replied in similar style messages. We, we wrote, Hokoyo Hondo Tenjara Shiro. Owen's uh, nickname was Shiro. So that means look out for the war, look out for Shiro. With drawings of the motorbikes with halos of the saints on our heads. We remained there at the school for an hour just to see whether any of the insurgents would like to carry out any of their threats. We were heading back using a well used vehicle road when Ephraim stopped to talk to a hut builder and his son. Ephraim then took the son um, and put him on his pillion to take him back to Enterprise for questioning as a possible Majiba. It was unusual to have the youngsters of that age around at that, at that particular time. Ephraim was then at the back of the line of motorcycles, two motorcycles ahead of me, then Kevin and I side by side. When approaching a store, I noticed marks across my side of the road, made from a round stick pressed into the sand, and then 100 yards further, two more of these sites following by a further three signs. My ESP then clicked in, uh, thinking these were warning signs at a railway crossing. I started to slow down to investigate this unusual pattern when behind us was a huge explosion. Ephraim had detonated a landmine. God help us, we were shattered. And immediately got on the radio and sent a coded message to Victor Alpha. That Victor Alpha is the local uh, relay station in the, in the enterprise farming area, naming the deceased angel. We were all sitting around when Mike Norton came on and asked us for a map reference as, we, as he had dispatched the crock with men from the Shamba site to come to our assistance. Mike also inquired as to where the huts in the nearby area were burning from the explosion. Enterprise was a leader in our enterprise district, plus being responsible for putting up the Victor Alpha relay station, 
to improve our communications. The men in the crocodile were mostly bright lights, but they came to our rescue nevertheless. A body bag was given to me. Very sadly, there was much not, left, not much left of our dear friend. Most of his limbs were gone. I grabbed the shirt collar with my right hand and my left hand holding the bag open. Hector Ludic helped me put what was left into the bag. Then we cleared up the mess, leaving the Majiba uh, who was deceased at the scene. The motorcycle stick then mounted, headed off cross country to Strasbourg. We did not want to travel on roads. As, this, as, a, as we were patrolling, we always, and after this, I went patrolling, always rode off to one side and looked out for any warning signs, which the insurgents must have made for the locals to avoid the landmines with the bus. Only later I discovered that when you went, when you went past schools, Sometimes children put fingers in their ears, and this was a lookout sign that there was a landmine ahead. When the stick returned to Oroby, they were all very distressed, especially myself, having known Ephraim most of my life. And Ephraim had come to work for his uncle, Laurie James, on the shop as a very, very young man. That's, a, and that's a very sad story. It's been told a few times, but yeah. to my, and if somebody knows more, I, it, I think it's the only thing time I've heard of a landmine setting off, uh, being set off by a, a motorcycle. Yeah. Um, so it was a great loss to enterprise, um, and one of the one of the few casualties, luckily, we took within the, within the district. Um, Owen follows up now to say, um, before leaving the site of the landmine where Ephraim had been killed, Hector and I looked for tracks in the crater where the landmine had exploded. We could see from the spoor the first motorbike had gone to the left of the crater. My own track straight over the centre, and then Ephraim ne never made it across with the extra weight of the Majiba that had settled the landmine. The front wheel had detonated the landmine. Then someone who knew about landmine explains it was a ratchet mine and would load two or more wheels to pass before, over before detonation. I attended another landmine incident on the Oroby, uh, on the Oroby store on the Shirley Cripps Orphanage Road where a landmine had been wired to torch batteries and a connection like a rat trap with a rubber hinge at the back and two three inch nails to make connection for detonation. A further landmine incident at Jura Township at the turn off from the Matoko Road where a bus detonated the landmine, blowing the legs of everyone on the left side of the bus. Horrific. These were all civilians. This happened on New Year's Day when the insurgents were assembling to go to the keep further in the Chipaka. What a senseless massacre. The carnage was awful. What a shit bad scene. I was actually having breakfast, praying to my family to Lake Macawan for the day. I collected medical kit, drips, and set off to Juru stepping carefully around the scene in case of anti-personnel mines. I counted seven bodies and called Victor Alpha for enterprise uh, base to send medics and ambulances. I endeavored people to get to the nearest store to assist and in helping me set up drips and cover the injured. But the people just faded away as usual. Couldn't find any sticks to hold up the drips. By the time I got reinforcements, the reinforcements, I'd set up four drips and was pleased to hand over to the medics. One BSAP was a police instructor, Rick Price Bryson, came with a monitor from England to see the carnage. Those are the, the days when the, the monitors were there to, to over, oversee the ceasefire. We discussed the issue, then I excused myself as I was in my civilian kit. It was now 12 noon and not, I'm not actually on call up. Many of the injured died of shock that night in, in, um, in hospital in Harare. A further landmine than Toka Marewa Road was heard and I went immediately again with medical kits that I had available. I was very concerned that the convoy from the farming area that hit the landmine. The convoy collected school children from Marewa farmers to take them to school in Harare. I remember that Gerald Cripwell and Basil Panis were in the group of police reservists from Marewa. But well armed, I proceeded up the tar road, passing the convoy of police reservists Escorts who told me to proceed further up the road as the bus was in trouble. The bus was one from Harare coming every Monday to pick up the passengers and workers to go into town. The bus had detonated a landmine at the collection point and before any of the passengers got on board. The landmine had been placed in the tar road by cutting a hole with a 20 litre tin with serrated edges and held by a short pole, the top of string to give it leverage. The item was then in the ditch near the scene of the explosion. On call up at Mount Darwin, while I was driving, I saw it looked like a petrol cap in the sand in the gravel road. So I called base and personnel arrived to uncover the landmine, obviously been uh, opened up due to the rains that had occurred. That's Owen's little stories on, uh, on his events with, with landmines, as you, can, as you can gather. 
not not just a farmer, not just a soldier, not just a hunter, but a humanitarian as well. The stolen fencing and stock theft. On Oropi, we were constantly having our boundary fences stolen. So between my manager, Dave Proud, and myself, we instructed that all standards were repainted red at the top for about 20 centimeters. And we also started with a daily horse system of horse patrols along the boundary fence lines. One of the systems that the insurgents had was to untie the fence from the standards for 100 meters. So when cattle were stolen, they would lay, lay the fencing down and drive the cattle over it into the Chipwaka area. This normally occurred on a moonlit night. When it was reported to me, a theft had taken place, I would inform Enterprise Base and the Goromanzi police station. When I reported this theft was probably going to take place, a Beatrice Patu stick was sent and put into cover. One of the Beatrice stick was a fellow old George, old St. George's scholar called Burton. But he'd arrived obviously without my knowledge. I heard firing at about 6 p.m. and then the radio base instructed me to remain at home and not interfere. The next morning I went uh, in my vehicle to the area to find the party on tracks. One stock theft was dead and the others indicated that they were either insurgents or stock thieves were heading towards Juru and Chipwaka settlement calls. I then went with my Labrador dog, a very good tracker, following the blood spore. I couldn't see any blood, but I'm looking closely where the dog was running. I noticed ants collecting bloods the size of pinheads. When I got to within 200 meters of, from the crawl line, I withdrew, feeling very naked without my FM. <coughs> Later in the day, I was briefed by the chap I knew from, from Beatrice called Burton, who said a body was found at one of the huts, but no one knew how it got there. Power of Potter reported that they saw men coming from the road and the, and the Chikwaka Road and waiting under a Mashasha tree. There were four people and the, it was in winter at about uh, 1750 hours. As was a curfew area, they waited and approached and then approaching the boundary. Then after 6 p.m. they opened fire on, on the people from about 150 meters. There was no casualties from that, but I'm sure the stock thieves uh, got, got the point that they were not particularly welcome. John, that's, that's, what, that's what I've got at the moment. Um, on, on Owen stuff, there's one more very good story, which only came through to me recently, and it, it requires a bit of my attention um, okay. to to write some. It was actually a, a scene I was on, so I remember it very well. Um, but I need to to just cut crop it and, and get it sorted out. So maybe we could add that on on, on, on Friday. Uh, 